this video I want to talk about protein structure, specifically an introduction to the levels of protein structure. So we talk about proteins in biochemistry a lot and it's important to understand how they work. And we mentioned earlier in a previous video or previous videos that proteins are made up of amino acids. And the reason why we mention that is because if we want to know how proteins work, then we should probably know how they how they look and how, how what their structure is like. Because we know as a theme in just in biology or in science in general, that structure determines function. So within protein structure, when we're talking about the levels of protein structure, there are four levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And I want to introduce you to those here. So the first is primary, generated by this one and a little degree symbol here. So primary structure, primary structure is quite simply the order of amino acids, the, the amino acid sequence, okay? The amino acid sequence in a polypeptide chain. So we mentioned polypeptides before and that's just the, the term used to describe a bunch of different amino acids linked together via peptide bonds. So primary structure is simply the amino acid sequence or the order of amino acid, the order in which amino acids are, are linked. Right, the order in which amino acids are linked together. Okay, so what's important to keep in mind about the primary structure? Well, the primary structure, in essence, determines the overall 3D structure of a protein. And initially hearing that might be kind of weird, it might be tough to understand, but hopefully through through watching these videos uh, it'll make more sense. But this determines the overall 3D structure. So, um, and another thing that you should keep in mind about it is that the primary sequence, or the primary structure, the sequence of amino acids is red uh, from the, oops, not red as in the color, red, it is red from the amino terminus, right, from N to C, or from the amino terminus to the carboxy terminus, right? So just to kind of give you an idea about what this primary structure sort of idea entails, think about it this way, is that if we have, let's say we have a few different amino acids. So we have, um, let's see, let's say we have asparagine, um, we have glycine, we have histidine, we have lysine, we have leucine, and we have alanine. Let's say we have these six amino acids, okay? So there can be two different scenarios, right? Or there could be actually a variety of scenarios, but imagine these two, for instance. So let's say we have the amino terminus here, right? And we got to link these six amino acids, okay? So Let's say we, we just link them actually in that order. Let's see, N, G, H, K, L, A. We link them all via peptide bonds, and then we have a carboxy terminus here. Okay, That could be one potential peptide. But we could have another peptide using those same amino acids. Right? Instead of having it in this order, we could have it as G, N, uh, L, H, K, A. Right? Now, these are both structured differently, and if they end up you know, folding upon themselves, you can imagine, obviously, that polypeptides can be much, much longer than this. But you can imagine that once these fold upon themselves, the fact that they're ordered in this different way might have a, you know, an effect on how these uh, peptides will, uh, will look when they fold. So even though these two peptides have the same exact amino acid composition, they will not... Um, look the same overall in the 3D structure. Okay, so that's the whole idea behind primary structure, sort of determining um, uh, what a protein will look like. Okay, um, that's in essence what primary structure is all about. 
So let's talk about uh, secondary structure. So secondary structure. What is secondary structure? So secondary structure is the simplest way I think to think about it is um, a, it's ordered patterns ordered patterns of 3D arrangements this might be a little bit technical just f for the time being 3D arrangements on localized regions localized regions of the backbone. Now notice I'm all capping uh, backbone and I'm even going to put a little red box around it. And the reason why is because this just keeping backbone in mind will help you a great deal I feel in kind of remembering what secondary structure is all about. So when when people think of secondary structure as far as um, uh, proteins go, they usually kind of just associate it uh, with hydrogen bonds, right? And, and that, that's a, that is a correct association. So there are hydrogen bonds that are involved in secondary structure. But in particular, in particular, these hydrogen bonds that we're talking about when we're talking about secondary structure is hydrogen bonds between, let me put this little BW here, between the carbonyls, carbonyl um, oxygens, right? and the um, the amide nitrogens hydro hydrogen okay so there are going to be hydrogen bonds between these carbonyl groups and these hydrogens here that are on the backbone of the amino uh, of the of the amino acid um, the polypeptide sequence um, and I'll kind of draw this out to kind of explain what I mean in just a second but there's one more uh, thing that people usually associate with secondary structure and that's alpha helices and beta pleated sheets so uh, I'll put alpha helix or alpha helices alpha helix or uh, a beta pleated sheet now I'll talk more about this the secondary structure just in general in a, its own video it's a little bit more complex than this is I want this to just sort of function as a as a brief introduction um, but let me kind of show you what I mean by by this uh, by this first bullet point here. These H bonds between the carbonyl oxygens and the amide hydrogens. So if we think about a short polypeptide sequence, let's just imagine this. We have um, you know our group of our first amino acid here, right? And then uh, we'll have this going on here. This, then this peptide bond here right and that's going to be the, this is going to be the next amino acid here right so this is going to have be a different R group so be hydrogen here this carbonyl here another peptide bond uh hydrogen you know, hydrogen there got these little electrons not that that's all too necessary there's some here as well oops okay and this will be a third amino acid let's just cut the peptide off there just for the sake of time okay so we have these three amino acids connected here with these two peptide bonds. So when we're talking about uh, these particular H bonds, we're talking about the H bonds that are existing, right, that exist between the backbone. Now what what is the backbone? Uh, I've mentioned before, maybe, or maybe not, that this whole idea of an NCC backbone when it comes to polypeptides. So um, let me just write that up here actually. So a back the backbone is typically considered, you know, N C C oops, let me actually clean that up a little bit. The backbone is sort of N C C and then N C C and it repeats. What people talk about the N C C backbone when it comes to polypeptides. What are they really getting at? They're getting at the whole idea is that you have a nitrogen and the alpha carbon and then the carbon the carboxy carbon, right? And then it repeats each time. So NCC and then you've got another NCC, NCC, and so on and so forth. If there were more amino acids in this in this chain, so now 
When we're talking about ordered patterns of 3D arrangements of the localized regions of the backbone, I want you to associate secondary structure with the backbone, specifically the carbonyls and these, uh, these uh, amide nitrogens here. So hydrogen bonds can exist, for instance, if you have a long string of amino acids and it somehow bends back upon itself in either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet, which again I will talk about in another video. Um, there may be hydrogen bonds between, let's say, like, um, this is amino acid number one, this is amino acid number two, three, maybe amino acid number 56, right, somehow, you know, in a beta pleated sheet, um, it's amide hydrogen comes near this, this oxygen, okay, so they can hydrogen bond. Let me draw it here, although this wouldn't, this wouldn't necessarily make sense, the hydrogen bond that would, that would exist if, uh, would be between this, this, you know, this carbonyl group and another, uh, amide hydrogen group, so, an H bond would be something like this, right, between them. Obviously, the, not in this case, it wouldn't actually happen. Um, again, I'm going to mention sort of details in the alpha helices and the beta helices in another video. But the point is, the hydrogen bonds, the hydrogen bonds that we're specifically concerned with when it comes to secondary structure, are the ones that are involving this part of the backbone. Okay, that's very, very important to keep in mind as far as secondary structure goes. And the reason why is because tertiary structure also includes hydrogen bonds, but the way those hydrogen bonds that we're going to look at are going to be a little bit different. So let's actually talk about that. Let me scroll down a little bit. Okay. Scroll down. Okay. So what about, what is tertiary structure then? Tertiary structure. Okay. What is tertiary structure? So tertiary structure is a little bit different. Now I just mentioned that it includes hydrogen bonds, but you know, what, what, if if these hydrogen bonds, if these hydrogen bonds along the backbone are not included, what, then what's going on? Let's let this define tertiary structure first. So tertiary structure is just the essentially the the um, the overall 3D arrangement of the protein. Okay. Now, this could include a bunch of different things. Um, just to kind of briefly mention a few things. Um, this will have, this will involve a bunch of different things, including conformations of the side chains. Right, it'll include um, the, the, like, sort of the interactions between the secondary structures. It'll include uh, relationships among and between secondary structures. And it could even include prosthetic groups. Okay, now what are prosthetic groups? Prosthetic groups are simply uh, components of, an, of a protein that are not amino acids. So, non-amino acid components. Uh, one quick example that I can think of is uh, is the uh, heme group in in hemoglobin. Okay, and we'll talk about hemoglobin in a future video as well. So, tertiary structure includes a bunch of different things, but mostly, mostly what I want you to consider or sort of be concerned with is, is the, um, this right here, side chains. Okay. I want you to really concern yourself with this side chains. So why do I say that? It's because normally that's what we're talking about when we're talking about tertiary structure. Although of course the overall 3D arrangement is the definition and of course that, that it involves a bunch of different things, but oftentimes when we're talking about tertiary structure, we're considering the side chains and how they're interacting with each other. So if we have amino acid number one and say amino acid number 50 in a long chain, maybe at some point when, they, when the polypeptide folds upon itself, uh, the R group from number one interacts with R group um, 50. And you know maybe there's a hydrogen bond there. That hydrogen bond would be considered part of tertiary structure, not secondary structure, because it would be a hydrogen bond between the side chains and not the backbone. So, um, so let me kind of branch this out really quickly, this whole side chains bit, to kind of give you an idea of what things you would, that would be included, right? When you're talking, what sort of interactions would you be considering 
when when thinking about um, when you're thinking about the side chains um, in tertiary structure. So um, there would be hydrophobic interactions. So um, so hydrophobic groups will want to sort of arrange with each other, right? So that's the whole idea behind um, like dissolves like. So polar groups will want to be close to polar groups, and nonpolar groups will want to be next to other nonpolar groups. So that that's that's uh, something to consider. Our groups that are both um, uh, nonpolar will want to associate with each other, and those that are polar will want to associate with each other. Okay, and we'll talk about this in more depth later. And again, I mentioned hydrogen bonds would also be uh, considered, but specifically these are hydrogen bonds between the side chains, right? Not the ones between the backbone. So if we had a serine, for instance, which has an R group of CH2OH, if it happened to be next to another uh, another group like that, and maybe it happened to be next to a tyrosine, those uh, those hydroxyl groups could potentially hydrogen bond together, and if they do, that'd be considered sort of uh, under tertiary st structure. Another thing is the idea behind electrostatic interactions. And again, I want to just sort of reiterate, I will be talking about this in more detail in its own video. I don't want this video to be an hour long, so um, <laughs> I, I'm just introducing this right now. So electrostatic interactions. Oops, interactions. This is the whole idea between um, uh, those groups that have side chains that have charges, right? So the acidic and basic groups um, opposite charges will attract, right? If you have a positive and negative uh, group together, an acidic and a basic group, they'll be attracted to each other. Those with like charges will repel. So this is the whole idea that charges play a role in attraction and, and you know repulsion between those side chains. And the last thing, which I think is very very important to to remember, we've mentioned it earlier, is uh, disulfide bridges. So um, this is between cysteine molecules, right? And again, we'll talk about how that that you know, that covalent bond that can be formed. Um, again, that that's going to be a classified under tertiary structure. Okay, more detail about these in their own video. I'll have an, uh, a video specifically for secondary structure and specifically for tertiary structure because they're far more complex than I can just talk about here. But this is a brief introduction. The last thing that I want to mention is quaternary structure. So, quaternary, right, structure. What is quaternary structure? Quite simply, this is just a bunch of, if there's more than one polypeptide uh, chain involved in the protein, then that's, that's, that level that you've reached is um, quaternary structure. So, this is just, this is just really multiple polypeptide chains interacting. So, uh, for instance, an example uh, of this could be like uh, hemoglobin, for instance, has four polypeptide units that associate together that end up uh, forming one functional protein. So, um, that, that the, the highest level of structure that hemoglobin has is quaternary. Whereas myoglobin, for example, and again we'll talk more about hemoglobin and myoglobin later, but the highest protein, the highest level of structure that myoglobin has, because it only has one polypeptide unit, is tertiary, right? It doesn't have multiple polypeptide units. So this might seem like a, a super simple definition here, but that really is all that's it, that it is. If a protein has multiple polypeptide units or polypeptide chains interacting to form one functional protein, then the highest level of structure that that protein has is quaternary structure. Um, that pretty much wraps up the introduction to protein structure. And again, I'll be talk I'll be making um, more specific videos about uh, the details behind secondary structure and tertiary structure, and I'll specifically talk about alpha helices, beta pleated sheets, and all these different things here, and how you know how they work, how they. I'll kind of draw them out for you just so that that'll, that'll make sense. And then I'll also talk about how these things can be disrupted, how protein structure can be disrupted. So I hope that introduction to protein structure sort of is uh, a good one, and I hope it was helpful. See you next time.